Hi everyone, welcome back to another instalment in the Nico the Vet series. <clears throat> Those of you who've been uh, paying attention will notice that there's been a bit of a, a gap since the last uh, video I've done and that's because uh, we, I took a little bit of a hiatus in the process of moving house but we're, we're back on it now and we'll carry on. <clears throat> Excuse me, so for today's talk I thought we might tackle the subject of dry eye in dogs specifically. So uh, it's self, rather self-explanatory. Dry eye means the eye is, is dry. Uh, the fancy name for it is keratoconjunctivitis sicca, which sounds like a bit of a mouthful, probably because <laughs> it is a bit of a mouthful. Kerato refers to the cornea. The conjunctiva refers to the mem uh, these transparent membrane lining uh, the outer part of your eye, as well as the uh, outer part of the eyeball, as well as inside of your eyelids. And sicca just means dry. So. So to understand what's going on, let's rewind a little bit and say, uh, obviously, if you're saying you've got a dry eye, by definition, there's an absence of moisture. Uh, and where does the moisture come from? The moisture comes from your, your tears. So your tears are secreted or, uh, by the tear glands, and you've got two uh, main, well, human beings, we've only got one main tear gland, which is the lacrimal gland, which is situated inside of the skull bone, sort of one there and one there, and they open via ducts into the eye and discharge pretty much water into the eye. In, in animals, they have a third eyelid, so we have two eyelids, an upper and a lower, and they have a third one on the inside which can move sort of across back in and out. And then inside of that third eyelid is another Imagine my fist is another gland, so you never see it. It's tucked away inside the corner of the eye under the third eyelid. Um, and that's called the hydarium gland, and that also contributes to tear production in dogs. Probably about 50% of the tear production. So half comes from the lacrimal, half comes from the hydarium gland. But then also around the uh, around your, your the opening of your eye, between your eyelashes, you have glands called the meibomian glands. And there's one between every single eyelash. And uh, uh, it sounds like a, a new concept, but it's not. Three things can go wrong with the meibomian glands. They can become infected, and then you would call it a sty. They can be blocked, and you'd call it a cyst. Or they can develop a growth, and the most common version of that is a meibomian adenoma. It looks like a little warty growth on the, on the eyelid. Um, the, the job of the meibomian my, glands is mostly to produce a, a sort of a mucousy, oily secretion. And that then mixes with the watery secretion from your, from your um, tear glands, the, lac the lacrimal and the hardarian in dogs. And that mixes uh, into a nice sort of, uh, a nice sort of um, uh, mixture, which we refer to as our tears. And effectively, uh, for, the, for, the, for the purposes of simplicity, think of the constitution of tears as being about one third water, one third mucus, uh, and one third oil. So the job of that, that solution is to not only keep your eye moisturized, but it's also to keep your eye lubricated. So your, eye, so your eyelids can move up and down over the, over the eye. Um, and, and think back to yourselves, just as a little aside, when you wake up in the mornings and you have sleep in the corner of your eyes, effectively what has happened there is, as you've been sleeping with your head on the pillow, there's a little sort of uh, indentation on the side of your nose, and a tiny bit of your tears will leak out into that indentation. And as it pools there, uh, and, and you sleep through the evening, the water part of the tears evaporates. So remember, one third water, one third oil, one third mucus. So as the water part evaporates, the bit you left with is the oil and the mucus in the corner of the eye, and it dries out. And mucus, not to put too fine a point on it, is just another word for, for snot, the same sort of the mucus snot secretion you would get from your nose. So that sort of dry, crunchy, muck you feel in your eye that we call sleep is basically dried out snot and, and oil. Um, and that helps you to understand what you expect to see in dry eye. So in dry eye, what's happening is the, the lacrimal and the hardarian gland are no longer making the water component of the eye, but you are getting the mucus and you are getting the oil component. So the patient, the dog, will present as, a, as an irritated eye because it's, it's, it's dry and it's irritated in the same way that uh, I suppose if, when you're very, very tired and you should go to bed and you get that sort of itchy, scratchy feeling in your eyes, that's probably what their eyes feel like. Um, so the absence uh, of water means you still have the mucus and the oil left. And if you look in these uh, dry eye dog's eyes, the classic sort of presentation is they have this snotty, mattery uh, sort of accumulation in the eye, which... Uh, is sometimes misdiagnosed as an infection because it looks like a sort of a snotty, pussy, uh, gloppiness on, on the surface of the eye, um, but it's not an infection. It's just the mucus and the oil component of the uh, of the tear uh, of the tears. Um, 
So these individuals are obviously uncomfortable to varying degrees because the eye is dry and scratchy. And over time, uh, over a long period of time, uh, that leads to uh, a thickening of the, um, the conjunctiva and of the cornea in the eye. And that, as that becomes thicker and thicker, it often becomes pigmented. And in the fullness of time, if these uh, eyes are, are not treated, you will ultimately ultimately go blind. So we, we, must treat, uh, we must treat these dogs. So how do we make the diagnosis? So we get a dog in, and it's, it's the most common trend are, are little dogs. So the smaller dogs, classically sort of poodles and, and West Highland white terriers, for example, will come in with this matry eye, which has been like that for months or sometimes even years, but progressively getting worse and worse with this yellowy, greeny, matry, snotty uh, accumulation in there. If we suspect that, we do a little test called the Schirmetier test, which is a fabulously clever test, and it must be named after Dr. Schirmer, who originally developed it. And all it is really is, just, imagine my finger is a strip of blotting paper. It's a strip of blotting paper, and we make a little sort of crook at the end of it there, make, we bend it over, and then you just hook it on the inside of the eye, and being blotting paper, it will absorb the water part of the tear. So it'll sort of suck the water out into the blotting paper. And there's calibrations along the, uh, the, the blotting paper in millimeters. So it's completely non-painful. The dogs don't mind it at all. It's a human test. Uh, you'll probably have it at some point in, in your life. And uh, the rule of thumb is you should produce at least 15 millimeters of tears in 60 seconds, in one minute. So we put it in for one minute and then sort of count, to, uh, count, count down 60 seconds and then read on the calibrations and you want more than six, uh, 15. If you are less than 15, then you have a dry eye. And the obvious thing to do is check the other side because an, in, uh, an important point is, yes, the very obvious cases of dry eye have this snotty mattery look, but some eyes may look okay and actually still be a dry eye. And, and those are, are great to pick up early because they haven't had any of these scarring, thickening changes in the eye yet. So, so uh, always test both eyes. So let's say you've now confirmed the diagnosis and you've said, okay, this individual has dry eye. The next question is, well, why? Uh, and sometimes it can be congenital. You can be born like this. Um, where you just are not producing uh, uh, tears, um, either because you haven't produced a tear duct or there's some problem with that, with that sort of system. Um, those cases are probably in the minority and, and what immediately comes to mind are Dachshunds. I see them in Dachshunds and uh, Chinese crested dogs uh, is another one. So if it's congenital, it would mean you were born with it. That's the, the first category. The second category is a dog who's been fine there, there, there for, for many, many years and then suddenly is diagnosed with a dry eye. Why has this happened? What we think happens is uh, it's an autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease means your immune system has made a mistake and it's misidentified a part of your body as not being a part of your body. And as soon as your immune system says, well, there's something in me that's not part of me, the immunologists use the concept of is it self or is it non-self? As soon as it's non-self, the immune system, uh, even if it's made a mistake and it's decided that, the immune system says, well, you know, if it's non-self, it's probably uh, 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 an invader like a virus or a bacteria, or worse still, it may be a tumor process starting up. So the immune system has a freak out and will attack that tissue. So if, if it is an infection, like a viral or bacterial infection, of course, that's completely appropriate. But if it's made a mistake and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's decided that your lacrimal gland and or your hardierian gland it's are no longer recognized as self and the immune system attacks it, well, that's no good because the immune system is really good at attacking things and it will destroy um, the, the glands, uh, the lacrimal and the hardierian gland function. So you no longer get the water production uh, going. So, so with that in mind, we can, let's consider the treatment option. So treatment option number one is to say, well, you don't have enough tears in your eyes, so I will put artificial tears in. I'll go down the pharmacist, buy the drops. Um, in principle, it makes sense. In reality, no, because your, your eye is constantly making tears uh, uh, and, it's, and it's constantly secreting them as they go over the eye. Every time you blink, your eyelid um, spreads them around and then they drain with a little duct in the corner of your eye out um, through your nose, which is why when you cry, your, your nose runs. And that system is just run, rinsing and running all the time. Uh, a bit like if you squirt the cleaner on your, on your windshield of your car when, when you're driving and get the wipers to go. Well, imagine that happens like all the time. So if, that's, if that process has stopped now because the autoimmune disease has, has destroyed your lacrimal glands or you were just born with them, with them not working, your problem now uh, 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 is that to get, to get it all uh, going again, to get it improved is 
yes, you can you can either put artificial tears in, but again, you're just not going to be able to put them in often enough because you cannot mimic this constantly filling, draining, filling, draining process unless you are putting the, the teardrops in the artificial tears in you know every five minutes, uh, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. If you could do that, probably you'd be okay. But in reality, that's just not going to work. You, you couldn't even do that for yourself. So a much more elegant solution to the problem is to try to stop the immune system attacking the, the lacrimal gland. And that way, the lacrimal gland can hopefully recover from the damage that has been done to it, and it can resume its normal function of producing the water part of the tears. And, um, and then it will produce the tears sort of uh, every minute of every day, and you don't have to try and do it yourself every minute of every day. So a much more elegant solution than replacing the tears manually is stop the destructive process and let the factory, the lacrimal gland, fire up again and start making the tears for you. So again, if we're saying it's the immune system which is attacking the lacrimal gland, clearly what we need to do is tell the immune system to back off. Now, um, how do you do this? You need immunomodulatory drugs. So you need medications that will tell the immune system to calm down. So the classic one that people would think about would be steroids. Um, the problem with steroids is they just don't seem to be effective in this condition. But fortunately, we have a, a, a few alternatives. Uh, probably the, the most well-known and probably my favorite, just because it works the most consistently, is cyclosporin. So cyclosporin is a, is a medication that in human beings, they would, they would sometimes give us, if you had an organ transplant, to stop your body recognizing your new liver as non-self and rejecting it. So it's a, it's a big hitting drug in human beings. In the veterinary world, it's, it's, um, we use it very, very commonly and it's very, very well tolerated in our patients because I know some people are anxious about using cyclosporin because they've heard anecdotally in human beings, you know, it's a really big deal drug, it's a very powerful drug, it can have, do lots of harm. Um, yes, that may be so in human beings, but it's not in dogs. So we're pretty laid back about using it in dogs. So it comes in an ointment. Um, the proprietary form of that is called Optimune. Um, it is devilishly expensive but it works really, really well. And we think what happens is you put it in your eye um, twice a day to begin with, um, and the, what we think happens is some of it goes back up the duct into the lacrimal gland, and when it in, sort of infuses into the lacrimal gland, it sits there and it protects the lacrimal gland from the immune system. So this is like, stop attacking me, and it, and, and it holds it at bay, and then the factory can resume normal production of the, the water part of the tears. Um, it works nine out of, times out of 10, it's a great product. It's not gonna work for your congenital case. So the case where you were just born with fundamentally, either without the lacrimal glands or fundamentally just defunct ones. Where it's effective is if the problem is being caused by an immune system um, reaction. You can get compounded formulas of it cheaper. So you can go to a compounding chemist and ask them to make it up for you as an eye drop. In, in my experience, it just doesn't work anywhere well, anywhere near as well as the proprietary uh, form called Optimune. So, that would be my first choice. If that doesn't work for you as an individual, and remember, no medicine works for everyone every time. If that one doesn't work, then an alternative eye drop uh, is tacrolimus, which acts exactly the same way. Again, you put it in the eye every day, it's very well tolerated. It goes back through the ducts and it protects the um, lacrimal glands against the immune system attack. Um, and we get quite good results with those. So there's some debate on whether we should use um, cyclosporin or tacrolimus. I think they're probably as, as good as each other. If both of those have failed, that's already a, 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 a concern for me in, in practice uh, because they work nine times out of 10. So if both of those fail, there is a, there is a third drug we can try called pilocarpine. Um, it's really more appropriate when, 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 the, when the problem in that case is not that the immune system is attacking the lacrimal glands, but more with the problem with the nerve supply to the lacrimal glands, telling them to, to do their job, which is to make the water part. So, so that's usually going to be a unilateral, so only on one side that you have the dry eye. And in that case, if it is a neurological problem, then pilocarpine may well solve your problem. Unfortunately, there are a small cohort of individuals who just don't respond to any of these medications. Uh, and, and what do we do about these guys? Well, like I said in the beginning, if you are not making enough moisture in your eye, your eye is gonna dry out, it's gonna suffer damage and scarring, and you will go blind, for sure, over, over time. So, so if no medication is working for you, we need some way of getting liquid into the eye 24-7 and it's not practical to try and do it yourself with eye drops. So some clever person somewhere along the line came up with a very elegant solution to this. We all have multiple salivary glands um, producing the spit in our mouths, and probably the biggest one is, 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 is the parotid salivary gland, which runs sort of down the side of your face about there. And it opens through a long tube that goes under the skin on your cheek and opens up into your mouth in about that sort of 
position just there. If you look carefully in your own mouth, you'll see a little, it looks like a little nipple there, and that's where that tube opens up inside. So some clever person figured out that what you can actually do is do an operation where you've got this salivary gland producing spit, again, not tears, but the tears and spit are remarkably similar. So you're producing a uh, spit and it's draining through this tube into your mouth. What you can do is a surgery where you relocate that and you have that tube opening up on the inside of the eye. So that means you, the, the spit you're producing is now going into your eye rather than your mouth. Of course, your mouth is fine because you've got many, many other salivary glands. And, and, and this ensures that the, that the eye is moisturized all the time. There are two potential problems with these. One is um, uh, quite striking, but not necessarily important, is that every time you, you, your dog sees food or you're about to feed them, and just like us, when you see something and you're hungry, you salivate, they'll get what appears to be a watery eye. And that's because basically they're producing a lot of drool that's coming out of their eye. And it just looks sort of, looks sort of wet fur on, on, on the edge there. Sometimes after the surgery, that will be quite pronounced for about uh, two, three, four months or so, but usually that will settle down and, and, and go away. Probably the biggest complication of the surgery uh, uh, itself, assuming the surgery all went, all went fine, is that there is more calcium in your spit than there is in your tears. And sometimes what will happen is that, that that higher level of calcium, and this varies significantly from individual to individual, but now that you've got this high calcium fluid going into your eye, it can lead to calcium deposits on the surface of the eye, and that's, that's a big headache. We can sometimes control that using a, a medication called doxycycline, and also anecdotally um, adding uh, buttermilk to, to your diet. So don't put the buttermilk in your eye, add it to your diet. Again, I don't know who, who thought this up, uh, but there's some anecdotal evidence to show that uh, if you have about 20 to 40 mils of buttermilk added to your diet, it reduces the amount of calcium in your spit, so you have less calcium in your eye. Um, so that is the, the ultimate sanction, is the, the surgery. I would always prefer to do the medications rather than the surgery, because things can go wrong with the, with the surgery. Um, um, ultimately, if you can't do any of these, uh, and it's cost prohibitive for some people, uh, you, can't, you can't do anything, then yes, you can palliate for as long as you can with moisturizing eye drops. Uh, um, but again, you're just never gonna match what the eye actually needs. And ultimately, you will have a long-term uncomfortable eye with varying degrees of, of pain or discomfort to the individual dog. And ultimately, they will always go blind. So, so really, if we possibly can, we would we would want to do something to help these guys. And they, it's extremely rewarding to help them. So, um, so you know, you would really would want to. So, to sum up, if you have um, a dry eye from uh, from birth, then really uh, the drugs that we try, you'd want to try them, but probably they're not going to work. And you're looking at a parotid duct relocation. Whereas if you've acquired the dry eye later on in life, um, again, the little dogs are overrepresented, particular West, particularly Westies, um, then you definitely want to try the medication. In the vast majority of cases, those will work for you. So, so eminently treatable condition and surprisingly common, uh, and unfortunately also uh, um, fairly commonly missed uh, in first opinion practice, where you'll see, you know, one, two, three vets, they'll give you some antibiotic eye drops. You, I will get a bit better because the, the eye drop has the effect of replacing the water that you're not produ uh, producing yourself. So you'll get some sort of respite and the eye will look a bit better and then it'll be worse again. So if you've been to the vet two or three times so it looks like a pussy, mattery, snotty uh, eye, um, just ask them uh, uh, if, they, if, uh, uh, if they haven't already done so, just ask them to do a quick Schirmetier test. It'll take all of two seconds to do and it'll give you a definitive answer one way or the other. And the trick is do these tests early in the progression of the condition so that you can reverse uh, uh, the damage that's already been done in, this, in the um, lab lacrimal glands and obviously uh, minimize any ongoing uh, damage. So eminently treatable, why wouldn't you? you can, it's life changing for these guys when we help them. So thank you all very much for, for tuning in and uh, watching another installment of the show. Uh, I hope to be adding many more in the near future. Thank you, bye bye.